Welcome to the last CCS Plus talk of the semester. Uh, we have David Stoyer from Cornell, and he's going to talk about um, symmetric extended formulations for approximate constraint satisfaction. So David completed his PhD from Princeton and is now faculty at Cornell. Um, well, now we don't have any more talks this semester, so we'll start next semester again. Uh, and we'll now go around the table. Uh, so first we have the group from Purdue. Hi guys. Uh, then we have the group from Michigan. Hey guys. Hello. Then we have TTI Chicago. We can see Mother and maybe there are a thousand others. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, OK, so uh, yeah, uh, just as usual, the uh, audience shall be muted during the talk. But if you have a question, unmute yourself, ask the question. Well, usually, uh, yeah, usually we mute them ourselves. But now Google somehow broke this feature, so we can't mute that you. So please try, make sure you muted. Yeah, uh, we <laughs> yeah, we can't force mute you, so you have to mute yourself. But unmute yourself if you have a question. <laughs> uh, OK, so I guess, OK, David can start now. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to this uh, series. Okay, so this uh, talk will be about um, constraint satisfaction problems and LP relaxations and uh, why um, the LP relaxations have to be large if you want to have good approximations for the CSPs. Uh, this is joint work with uh, C. Yuan Chan uh, from MSR, James Lee from Washington, and uh, Prasad Raghavendra from Berkeley. So if you look at the best known algorithms, especially approximation algorithms for combinatorial optimization problems like um, graph partitioning problems or network design problems, then and, and you try to um, uh, you know, identify uh, a common core, then what you'll see is that um, many of these, uh, most of these algorithms, they are based um, on, uh, on the same algorithmic workhorse which is um, linear or semi-definite programming. Okay, so these are optimization problems that you can solve in um, polynomial time. And they have um, geometric flavor. Can... Uh, a pointer. So, so, for example, linear programming is, um, you know, you want to optim optimize a linear function over a polytope intersection of um, half spaces. And uh, semi-definite pro programming, we also want to uh, optimize a linear function, but now over um, a different kind of body, which is more round. Okay, and there's, you know, something um, very surprising about this, you know, because uh, the problems that we started with, they were very combinatorial, and, uh, and somehow it um, you know, you would expect maybe that combinatorial algorithms are best suited for these problems, but uh, it turns out that you know these problems with geometric flavors um, work uh, give the best uh, guarantees. Okay. Um, so for this talk, the granularity that I have in mind for running time will be quite coarse. So we will, you know, we will try to distinguish between uh, polynomial time, uh, exponential time, or you know something in between. If you go to um, you know, finer granularity, like nearly linear, linear time algorithms, the algorithmic techniques are more varied. But uh, even there, you, the common uh, recurring theme is um, a technique called multiplicative weight update. And uh, this, this technique can be viewed as a, as a particularly good way of solving linear or semi different programs that is suited for combinatorial optimization problems. So somehow, yeah, uh, linear and semi programs seem to be uh, central for these kind of optimization problems. And um, so what do I mean when I say that these um, algorithms are based on uh, linear or semi programming? So what I mean is that based on a particular kind of reduction from the hard problem to uh, this easy to these easy optimization problems. Um, so you know the reduction takes us uh, takes an instance for the combinatorial problem and writes down uh, an instance for the optimization for the uh, the geometric optimization problem and this instance you know can be described as uh, it's a program like this um, 
And um, because you know the running time, the reduction should be efficient. The the size of this uh, prog the size of this um, program will be um, you know um, uh, should be small. In particular, the you know the running time of the whole algorithm will be dominant. It will be polynomial in the size of the relaxation that uh, that, we, that the reduction writes down. Um, and so, so these these kind of reductions are called uh, LP or SCP relaxations. And what we're trying to understand is, so, you know, if you're if you're following this approach, what are the best possible guarantees that we can get in terms of approximation and running time? Okay. So let me just give you a very brief example of um, of an SCP, of an LP relaxation. So this is for max cut. So this problem, uh, you're given a graph and you want to find a bipartition of the graph that cuts as many edges as possible. A bipartition like this. So we will uh, throughout this talk we will encode bipartitions as uh, uh, vectors indexed by the vertices, um, and uh, the entries are plus one or minus one. So plus one corresponding to one side of the bipartition, minus one corresponding to the other side of the bipartition. And then <coughs> you can consider so this uh, problem is equivalent to the following optimization problem. Um, so you want to um, uh, Maximize uh, this linear function in mu i j subject to these linear constraints and uh, subject to the constraint that mu i j is either zero or one. The intended solutions uh, for this um, problem are: uh, for every bipartition, you know, you look at the vector mu, mu, mu x sub i j, which which is one exactly if uh, i and j are uh, on different sides on the, the cut. And uh, for this intended solution, the objective value is exactly equal to the Fraction of edges that are cut uh, by the repetition, um, and this this optimization problem also has a property that you know any solution to um, uh, to the pro to the it turns out that any solution to these constraints uh, will actually be one of the intended solutions. Okay. Now this is not a linear program. This is an integer linear program because of this uh, last constraint, and um, if we relax this integer constraint to a linear constraint. Then uh, we, we we get a linear program that we can now solve efficiently because uh, yeah, it's a small size. Um, now the, and the question is, you know, how does how does this relaxation step uh, change the uh, value, the optimal value of the program? So if you know, without this, um, uh, so if if we had this integrality constraint, then it would 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 compute exactly the maximum cut. Um, if it, if you relax it, then uh, we might get um, a larger value, and so the question is how much larger can it be? Um, so this 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 way of thinking. So this way of thinking, we will actually not, not think about LP relaxations in this way. For the stock, I, I presented in this way because this seems to be um, the most common uh, explanation. One, one nice thing about this way of thinking about it is it has a very clear best case. You know, if, if you solve the linear program and the solution happens to be integer, then uh, you know that. Um, uh, you, you found an optimal solution, uh, but you know we're interested in worst case analysis, and you know in general it will not be the case that the solution is integer. Yeah. Another remark here is, so, so as I said, the, the the size of this program is small; they're only n-cubed inequalities. And uh, another interesting thing about it is that uh, the constraints do not depend on the instance itself. So the the constraints only depend on the number of vertices that you have. Uh, the only place where the instance appears is in the objective function. In this Makes sense because in max, max cut, you know, the solution space does not depend on the instance. Okay, so this is uh, this. These are linear program relaxations. Now, there are several challenges uh, we face when we try to understand them. The one challenge is that um, you know, for for for, se for the same problem, there are many different ways of uh, coming up with relaxations. Um, you know, in particular, there are many different ways of writing integer linear programs that you know, are equivalent to your problem. And uh, it turns out that if you relax them, then you, you get uh, you can get vastly different uh, uh, results. And so the challenge is to you know come up with a way to identify the right um, polynomial size relaxations for um, for a problem. A way to um, address this uh, challenge are hierarchies. So hierarchies are <coughs> systematic ways for constructing you know, relaxations. And uh, there are ma many different hierarchies. The best known hierarchies are Schrader Adams for the LP case and uh, some of squares, which is also known as uh, Lasea for the STP case. And you know, 
these are the best known hierarchies, but you know it's not clear if these are the best possible hierarchies using linear programming or semi-linear programming. And so that's something that we'd like to understand. Um, you know, are there better hierarchies, or um, you know, can we compare um, the power of hierarchies to the power of general linear programs or STPs? Um, another challenge is that um, you know if we um, uh, it's often the case that if you make the relaxations uh, larger, more, more, com more complicated, which usually means that you get larger, then uh, you will get better approximations. Okay, but if P is different from NP, then uh, you know, it predicts that there are limits, absolute limits to, to the kind of approximations that you can get. Okay, and, um, so the question is, you know, can we confirm uh, these limits um, unconditionally without assuming uh, P not equal to NP? That uh, you know, you, that even though if you make the, uh, the sort of no polynomial size uh, relaxation, can get a certain approximation. And so, so here we, we you know we, we can think of uh, these relaxations as computational models, and or classes of algorithms. And another way of phrasing this is that you know, we'd, but we'd like to rule out that uh, you can you know, um, re you know, that that uh, that you could prove that p is equal to NP based on uh, polynomial size LP relaxations, for example. Okay, so now let me talk a little bit more about um, um, previous um, results. So first about hierarchies. Um, so as I said, there's a great variety, and it's even worse in some sense. It turns out that some hierarchies, there are different ways of applying them to the same problem, and you get uh, with both these different uh, guarantees. Um, okay. um, so the best known hierarchies are, as I said, Gerard Adams and uh, some of squares for the LP and SCP case. What is nice about them is that they have a very nice and clean connection to proof complexity, in particular to polynomial calculus or um, positive Stern-Satz refutations. So let me. So what do we know about lower bonds? <coughs> so there are many lower bonds known. So let me just mention uh, two kind of lower bonds that are relevant for the talk. So we know that. Um, you want to use uh, Schrader M's hierarchies then to, to for max cut, and you want to have a better approximation uh, than one half, which is sort of a trivial bound for max cut, then uh, Schrader Adams needs relaxations of size, you know, uh, two to the n to the omega one. Okay, so in particular, there are no polynomial size relaxation. Uh, in particular, in particular, Schrader Adams doesn't give you polynomial size relaxations that give that give better approximations than half for max cut. For um, some of squares, we know that uh, if you look at relaxations for max free set, there is another uh, optimization problem, and you want to beat the um, uh, the trivial bound of seven over eight, then this requires um, exponential size uh, sum of squares relaxations. Okay, so these are lower bonds for the sizes of the relaxations that you need um, in these hierarchies if you want to get certain approximation guarantees. So David, it's uh, uh, it's still uh, conceivable that you can get uh, better than half in running time two to the square root n or something uh, of that form. For yes, Max this, yeah. yeah, this is a good open question. Uh, that's true. Okay. I mean, I think the conjecture is uh, no, um, but the cur current construction they don't rule that out. That's correct. So that's the conjecture, despite the sub-exponential time algorithms for unique games. No, see, so it's these LP are, here. These are, right, right, for uh, LP. So let, me, right. let me make this a bit clearer. So these are, so right, this is linear programs. Right. So you, 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 know, you time your hands here. And uh, it's also, you know, you try to beat one half for max cut. So, uh, you know, trying, I mean, so there are algorithms, I should say that. So there are very small polynomial size um, STP relaxations for max cut that, um, that get a better approximation than one half. In particular, if you take a sum of squares relaxations of size n squared, this this will get better than one half uh, for max cut. So it's, it, there, yeah, there's no connection to uh, I mean so this uh, two to the n to the omega one is not related to not exactly related to unique games. Mm, right. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, now in terms of upper bounds, so. Um, um, Many algorithms are using hierarchies in an implicit uh, way, meaning that you know they, they, they are based on uh, uh, LP or STP relaxations, and the way these relaxations are you know 
were found was inspired, you know, uh, could, can be justified or uh, using hierarchies or you know em employs the same kind of uh, reasoning that, that, that is used in hierarchies. And here's an examples are MaxCut and SparseCut. Um, but recently there have also been um, algorithms that are explicitly based on, on, on these hierarchies, for example, uh, for coloring, unique games, or uh, max bisection. And um, yeah, so some of these algorithms have the property that you sort of um, need uh, larger and larger uh, relaxations uh, uh, to get better and better um, guarantees. Uh, some kind of uh, smooth trade-off between the relaxations that the between the size of the relaxation that the hierarchies provide and uh, the approximation guarantees. Um, yes. Now, okay, so this was about hierarchy, hierarchies, and, um, uh, and a different um, uh, line of research. Or so before before this work, these, these two line of research were disjoined. Uh, so another line of research is um, you know that you try to get lower bounds for general. Uh, Let's say LP formulation. So this is sometimes you know, uh, called uh, extended form. Try to get lower bounds for extended formulations. Um, but so, so the kind of LP relaxations that I will consider, they will always allow for this uh, extended formulation uh, freedom. And um, this started with a really groundbreaking work of Yanakakis. Um, so he, he provided a, a way to characterize what's the um, smallest. Uh, general LP relaxa uh, relaxation for a problem. And he also showed that um, symmetric formulations require exponential size uh, if you want to solve uh, the traveling salesman problem or the matching problem, exactly. And uh, so there's a very nice story behind this work. So um, uh, you know, the motivation was that there were, at the time, there were several flawed uh, proofs for p equals to np that we're based on uh, you know LP relaxations for more TSP. So they claimed that you know there's uh, n cubed or n to the five LP relaxation that solves um, TSP exactly. And um, you know so people try to find you know the counter examples that show that these relaxations are not not exact. You know they fail on some instances. And uh, you know, of course there was some kind of feedback loop. Uh, you know whenever you know people found counter examples, then you know the author would go back and modify the relaxation so that it would take care of this uh, particular instance. You know, a priori would think that this could go um, on for long, you know, for forever, you know, that whenever someone comes up with a bad instance, you fix the algorithm so that the algorithm works in that instance. But uh, what, what Yannakakis said is that, uh, you know, there's no way um, of, of, of doing this uh, in polynomial, uh, with polynomial size uh, relaxations as long as they're symmetric. And there have been some recent uh, developments um, to Im improve upon uh, this very early work of Yanakakis. So in particular, recently this restriction on symmetric uh, on symmetry was removed. So now we know that um, even general LP relaxations, non-symmetric LP relaxations require uh, exponential size for TSP. Um, now, so all these, all these results have, uh, were for uh, the case that you want to solve these problems exactly. You know, for this optimization problem, it's automated to consider if you want to solve them approximately, and um, so, so you can also extend uh, um, these lower some of these lower bonds to the approximate case, in particular for clique. Um, and uh, very recently, uh, um, um, uh, the uh, Rod was showed that um, the maximum matching problem, even though it's a problem that you can solve in polynomial time, it requires exponential size uh, uh, relaxation to solve it exactly, even if you um, even if you, if you consider non-symmetric relaxations. Uh, David, so in general, uh, can any polynomial time computation be encoded as a LP, or does the for this encoding, does the LP need to depend on the instance? Yes, okay, these are good questions. So, you know, if you could encode every uh, P computation as a, li a linear program relaxation, then, uh, you know, these lower bounds would show that P is different from NP. Um, so, so, so it turns out, yeah, so the formal notion of LP relaxation that I, I have in mind, uh, which I will define later on, will, will not allow arbitrary polynomial time computation. Oh, okay. um, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. And this, of course, is uh, important. Um, and uh, so another um, maybe a question that arises in this context sometimes often is that um, uh, so it's, you know some, sometimes you can solve linear programs by um, using a separation oracle, 
you know, even though the number of constraints is maybe very large, um, you can solve it uh, in polynomial time using a separation oracle. But to a certain extent, um, if you're using a separation oracle, then you know, in an arbitrary polynomial time separation oracle, then um, it's questionable if you can still call your algorithm a linear programming algorithm because, you know, for example, I can uh, you know a semi-definite program. You know, I can think of it as a as a linear program uh, with exponentially many constraints that happen to have a, a polynomial time separation oracle. And uh, you know, in, in general, you would expect that you know every optimization problem that you can solve in P that um, you know there exists a polynomial time separation oracle. Okay. Um, and here, so one uh, there's a nice, very nice geometric uh, idea behind uh, these works. And uh, this idea is that you know. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, the the matching result mm -hmm. is that. Um, for bipartite graphs, or does that rely on non bipartiteness? Uh, no, 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 it relies on non bipartite. Okay, thanks. For bipartite graphs, you have a polynomial size uh, LP. Okay, that's what I thought. And um, uh, yes, so, so the geometric idea is that, you know, if you look at TSP, it corresponds to a certain polytope. and uh, in a certain sense, in a sense, this is this polytope is very complicated. It has an exponential number of facets, um, and so the geometric idea behind these works is that you know you ask, can uh, can a complicated polytope be the projection of a very simple polytope? And there are examples where this is the case. You know that uh, you have a polytope with exponential number of facets, and it's a projection of a polytope, you know, in higher dimension, but but in the higher dimension you only have a polynomial number of facets. David, this is isn't this the answer to uh, Anindya's question? Because you're restricting uh, what you're only what you're considering are only LPs that are of the form project um, something to the TSP polytope, right? Um, so, so yeah, we will see um, later. Uh, there's a different way of thinking about it. Um, but but yes, yeah, so, so that's one way of saying what kind of LPs you consider. Yes. But you know, um, I mean, if you're solving the traveling salesman problem, you know, eventually you have to um, you have to deal with the traveling salesman polytope. So it's um, it's not completely clear what what um, mm. what it means that you're restricting sort of to this polytope. Okay, so uh, I'll wait. <laughs> yeah. So um, okay, so, so now what I want to talk about here is um, uh, work that that. that so sort of joins these uh, lines of research about hierarchies and uh, general um, general law bounds for relaxations. And uh, so what we what we what we will uh, see is that um, general polynomial size LP relaxations for maximum constraint satisfaction problems are no more powerful than uh, polynomial size LP relaxations, uh, polynomial size uh, Shirley Adams relaxations. And uh, the, the correspondence is even a bit stronger. If you look at um, N to the D size uh, LP general LP relaxations, they really correspond to N to the D size um, Shirley Adams uh, relaxations in terms of the approximation guarantees that you can get. And uh, this correspondence holds not, not only up to polynomial uh, sizes, but also up to quasi polynomial sizes. Almost quasi polynomial sizes. Okay. And now, because, <coughs> because, we have, uh, because we know a few things about uh, Shirley Adams, uh, we can get, um, you know, this result implies uh, some concrete consequences about a general polynomial size LP relaxation. In particular, you know, there are certain approximations that are hard to achieve, that are NP hard to achieve, in point, uh, that are NP hard to achieve. For example, a point and nine approximation for max cut, max three set, or max two set. And uh, so, in this way, um, and, and, and for for Shirley Adams, we know that you need, um, you know, more than polynomial size relaxation to achieve these relaxations. To achieve these approximations, and now this you know this result immediately implies that you know also general LP relaxations require uh, uh, you know the super polynomial size to achieve these mm -hmm. relaxations. And so what this means is that um, you know that you that in this way um, you cannot um, uh, prove that uh, p is equal to n p. These kind of algorithms cannot you know be ruled out. Uh, it's ruled out that these algorithms uh, prove that p is equal to n p. Um, now, um, this result also implies that um, polynomial size LP relaxations cannot refute the Nagin's conjecture. 
um, so for some um, optimization, for some max CSPs, the best known algorithms are based on linear programming relaxations. And uh, you know the Niemann's conjecture predicts that uh, these relaxations are uh, achieve the optimal guarantees. And um, for sure, IMs, we know that you need super polynomial sized relaxations if you want to beat them. And and this result also implies that you need um, uh, that general IP relaxations require super polynomial size. Uh, another consequence is that it uh, the, result, the result gives a, 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 stri a strict separation between linear programming and uh, semi-linear programming. So, as, 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 as we mentioned before, um, you know, there are polynomial size relaxation that get uh, pretty uh, polynomial size SCP relaxation that get pretty good approximations for max cut, also for max two set, and um, uh, this universality result implies that general LP relaxations um, cannot get uh, these kind of approximations for for max cut. Okay, so, so, e so even if you know. Look at n to the hundred uh, general LP relaxations. They cannot beat, um, uh, you know, LP, uh, STP relaxation of size n squared uh, for max cut. Okay. So, um, in, so in, for the rest of the talk, I want to explain some of the ideas behind uh, this universality result, and um, so the focus will be on max cut, just because it's uh, you know very concrete and uh, simple to describe uh, problem. The uh, you need you need some notation. So first, the cut function of a graph. So that for every bipartition, the cut function of the graph tells us what's the fraction of edges that the bipartition cuts in the graph. And then uh, you will also uh, sort of um, so we will we will also have uh, so max cut sub n is the um, set of max cut instances on n vertices, so which means that are all weighted graphs on n vertices. And uh, what we will try to do is we will try to compare. Uh, LP relaxations of uh, size n to the roughly d, uh, the approximations that they can achieve to uh, um, uh, into the d size uh, Shavari Adams relaxations and uh, the approximations that they can achieve. Okay, so you know, de de you know, depending on what d, what value d is, you know, general LP relaxations will achieve a certain approximation for max cut, and uh, Shavari Adams, uh, you know, will achieve a certain. Uh, Approximation for max cut, and uh, um, the claim is that uh, these 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 approximations are the same. Okay, so now let, let me formulate. Uh, no, we want to prove this lower uh, bound. David, uh, uh, David, the epsilon is going to be the difference in the approximations, like uh, half and half plus um, epsilon. Is, is that yes. The role of the epsilon? Yes. Yes. And but it holds for all epsilon. So this epsilon, you know, um, it's good in both cases, right? I mean, so epsilon being small is good. Um, you know, uh, for the in terms of the approximation, you know, it means that you're close in the, the approximation guarantees, and you're also close in the sizes. So, um, so, so the point is here that epsilon is restricted to. Um, I mean, you can choose it slightly subconstant, but um, okay. So there's some for all quantifier for for the epsilon. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we have to uh, so to prove lower bounds. You know, we have to define what a, a general LP relaxation is, and so, so so that's what we will do now. Um, okay, so what is a general LP formulation, uh, LP relaxation for max cut? And uh, I want to do it very, uh, very, very abstract. Uh, so I don't want to, you know, talk about n squared dimensional vectors or something. Like that. Uh, I want to make it, you know, just just to point out what's what's the what's the um, crucial uh, part. So general LP relaxation for max cut has two components. So it works for all instances of size n, and um, of on n vertices. And there's uh, two components. So for every instance, for every max cut instance of size n, so for every graph of on n vertices, we will associate a, a linear function, um, L sub g, and uh, for every bipartition on n of n vertices, we will associate a vector mu sub x. And this association should have the property that you know the linear function uh, evaluated at uh, the vector corresponding to a bipartition should be equal to the cut function of the graph evaluated at the bipartition. Yeah, so now, you know, do these linearizations exist? Uh, so you know, we have we've seen an example before, uh, and this is in something that this is the only property that we used about this construction. Because if you know, if we look at uh, these kind of uh, linear functions, so they just sum up um, mu, mu i sub j over all edges of the graph, and uh, then if you look at um, these vectors corresponding to a bipartition, then um, you know if if you if you evaluate the linear function at the vector, it just gives you the fraction of edges that are cut in the graph. And so, you know, it's it's very easy in general to construct uh, linearizations of, uh, of of functions that you try to optimize. So I should say, 
Right? Max cut is really the problem, you know, maximize the cut function of a graph over the hypercube. So that's, uh, you know, the one way of describing max cut. And you have some functions you're trying to optimize and some solution space, you know, the set of by partitions that you're optimizing the function over. So, so this construction you know, works for, you know, any problem, any optimization problem that you can phrase in this way. You know, you have a certain kind of objective functions and uh, a solution space that you want to optimize the function of. Now, uh, this is one component of uh, periodization. The other component, uh, important component, is uh, the poly is a polytope. So a polytope of size r. So this means you know, some uh, subset of r to uh, of r to the m. R to the m is the space that uh, these objects live in, and it's defined by uh, r uh, linear inequalities. For example, the intersection of R um, half spaces, and it has a property that it contains all these vectors minus of x. So that's what we want. Um, and uh, it's important that we have, you know, we have the same polytope for every uh, for every instance of size of on n vertices. Okay. So this year, you know, this year, this linearization on the polytope stays the same for for uh, it's the same for for for, in, for so given n. Uh, you have one linearization. Okay, and um, okay, the, the reason why it makes sense that the polytope does not depend on the instance is because um, you know the set of by partition does not depend on on the instance. It just depends on n. Okay, the solution space for max cut does not depend on the graph. So, so now, is that the answer to only this question? Uh, yes. So, so this this is a, this is this is an important restriction that we don't allow the polytope to restrict uh, to depend on the instance. If you if you allow the polytope to depend in very sim in a very simple way on the instance, like um, sort of in a sort of projection kind of way, then uh, like if you yeah then uh, you can encode arbitrary polynomial time computation. But the linearization does depend on the graph on the instance concerned here. Yes, I mean the, the linear function that you associate uh, with the graph that, that yeah that, that can be uh, that will depend that's the place where the instance in enters. Okay. Okay. So now let's just see how how, how, how we can how how we can you know, approximate the value of the maximum cut in using this uh, periodization. You know, we get, get get a graph on n vertices. Now we look at the associated linear function and we optimize this over the polytope. Um, that we have for uh, graphs on n vertices, and because this polytope contains um, mu sub x, this value will be you know, an upper bound on the uh, maximum value of the graph, maximum cut, maximum, uh, and the value of the maximum cut in the graph. And the question is how you know how far is this? And there are different ways of measuring uh, uh, this. So first of all, okay, I want to say that um, you know because mu uh, the polytope is defined by r inequalities, you can Compute the maximum. You can solve this linear program in time polynomial. You know? um, so the different ways of measuring how good the relaxation is. So one is approximation ratio. Familiar. The way I want to do it uh, here is um, it's a more it's a finer way of measuring it. Is uh, so we say um, the p relaxation achieves a CS approximation for max cut instances of size on, on n vertices if for every um, Graph on n vertices where the optimal value of the maximum cut is where the value of the maximum cut is at most s. It's the case that the linear program can certify that the optimal value is at most c. Okay, so that's uh, so for instances where the value is at most s, the um, LP can certify that the value is at, is at most c. So that's what it means to achieve a c versus s approximation. You know, if c is equal to s, then you're solving the problem exactly. Uh, in general. C, C will be larger than S, and uh, how much larger and, than S is will, will determine the quality of the approximation. Okay, so now this looks like a relatively general uh, model of computation. So how, you know, what's the strategy of improving uh, lower bounds in this model? And this is uh, where uh, Yanakakis is, you know, comes in. So he has a characterization of this, in, of the minimum size of an LP relaxation to get a certain uh, guarantee. Uh, in terms of a non-negative rank of certain matrices, uh, so in so for this work um, we will use a slightly different formulation of this characterization. It's equivalent, but it's a different formulation. Um, so here it is. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's quite intuitive. So the characterization is as follows. So it says that every size r LP relaxation for max cut, you can for every such relaxation you can. Uh, Find non-negative functions. This relaxation corresponds to non-negative functions q1 up to qr on the hypercube, with the following property that the LP can certify that the value of a group, 
the maximum cutoff of graph is at most c, if and only if you can express the function c minus the cut function of the graph as a non-negative combination of the r functions q1 up to qr. So if you can express c minus the cut function of a graph as a non-negative combination of non-negative functions, that means that this function, that c minus the cut function of the graph is, no, is a non-negative function. And that means that, you know, um, no cut in G has value larger than C. So no, no cut in G has value larger than C. Okay, so this, this representation certifies that uh, the optimal um, value of the instance is in most C. And um, another way of uh, thinking about this, um, these functions is that they provide a canonical uh, form for linear programs of size R. So where's the linear program of size R here? Well, you can consider the problem of minimizing C such that you can write C minus the cut function as a non-negative function, as a non-negative combination of these functions. Now, this is a linear program, and it has R variables, uh, you know, lambda 1 up to lambda R, that are restricted to be non-negative. So here are the R non-negative R inequalities that define the linear program. And uh, so you're trying to solve this linear program. So that's, that characterizes the smallest value of C such that you can have um, uh, a representation like this. Okay, there's sort of one subtle point, um, and uh, so that's you know if you look at this equality, this is really an equality between functions on two to the n points. Okay, so you would think that you know now we are in exponential dimension, but um, this turns out not to be a problem. You know you can, for generic reasons, you can reduce the dimension to something polynomial in R. Uh, there's sort of some general philosophy that um, you know if, in terms of optimization. Uh, equalities are very easy, but uh, inequalities are, are hard. So in the setting, Q1 to QR are independent of the instance, but lambda 1 to lambda R are the yes, things which they will depend, depend on they, 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 they will depend on G. Yes. So, so Q1 up to QR, in some sense, encodes the po uh, polytope and, and, the linearization, and the linearization of the vectors. So and, and another way of thinking about it is that the, uh, there's a canonical linearization corresponding to every um, to every um, problem. And uh, okay, let's just get more intuition about these functions. So, for example, let's see that uh, if we have two to the n functions, then uh, you know we can uh, we can certify we can certify things exactly. Okay, so how what two to the n functions should we choose? So we can just choose the two to the n functions that correspond to the standard basis in this vector space. So you know it will be functions that are one at exactly one point of the hypercube and zero everywhere else. Okay. So now clearly every non-negative functions you have every non-negative function you can write as a non-negative combination of these basis functions. And so this shows that you know there exists um, uh, two to the you know empiric uh, for Maxcard that solve Maxcard exactly, uh, and the size is two to the n. So now, um, so so far I haven't talked about Shirley Adams at all. The reason was that uh, it's somewhat cumbersome to define Shirley Adams. So if you have seen it often enough, you know you get used to it. But um, uh, but, it's, but it's a bit uh, cumbersome. You need um, sort of variables. Course, I'm usually described in terms of variables corresponding to subsets of of vertices. Um, in this in this characterization, it turns out that Shirley Adams corresponds to something very natural. And uh, maybe following, so Shirley-Adams relaxations for max cut of size n to the d exactly correspond to the uh, to 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 non-negative to non-negative combinations of uh, non-negative d juntas on the hypercube. Okay. And what is a d junta? A d junta is a function that depends on at most d of the coordinates. Out, out of n possible coordinates, it depends only on d of them, and um, here, uh, let me uh, discuss something else first. And it turns out that if you look at all non-negative combinations of non-negative d-juntas, you can th 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 there exists um, uh, n to the d base juntas out of which you can generate, uh, you know, from which you can generate all of these non-negative combinations. So, so, so in, in some sense, so this really corresponds to a, uh, a periodization of size n to the d. Or another way of thinking about it, they are really only n to the d different uh, non-negative d hunters. Okay. Um, so the intu intuitive uh, way of looking at Schrodinger's is that um, 
it uh, it can derive all inequalities that have local proofs or that uh, you know that are true for local reasons. Okay, and, uh, you know the locality is precisely uh, corresponds precisely to the fact that the d juntas depend on only uh, a, few, a small number of, of the vertices of the graph. Okay. So, so David, just um, uh, yes. just to make sure. So there's is there just one unique shared atoms of size n to the d? For uh, for Maxcat, yes. For Maxcat, yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're talking about one. What you're saying here is there's a fixed LP. Uh, the, the one you call n to the d size. So for every d, yes. there is a unique LP in yes. the n to the d size. I see. And that's yes. what it looks like when you go through the Anikakis framework. It yes, just exactly. looks like the exactly. yeah the functions are. So the functions are just enumerating all possible d juntas. Right? The q's yes. just range of all q juntas. Yes. Or yeah, you I mean you you know you take a basis for these d juntas like. You know, for every subset of size d, you you have the you have two to the d basis functions for. All right. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Now, uh, so that's good. So now, um, just a slightly different way of thinking about it. There's a nice, nice, nice geometric way of thinking about this picture. And uh, geometric way is that you know, if you look at the set of non-negative, the set of functions that you can write as non-negative combinations of these R. Uh, Functions, this 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 set of functions you can visualize it as a cone, you know, in two to the n-dimensional space. And so, you know, you're you're asking here whether c minus whether this c minus the cut function is contained in the cone or not. Okay, and um, you know, because these are convex sets, there's a you know, there's a canonical way of proving that the function is not contained in a in a cone, and that's using these uh, using separation separating hyperplanes. So this will be used in the this will be using that in the proof, but um, for the discussion here, it's high level enough that you don't have to worry about that. Um, okay, now what what you know what, what you want to do is you want to rule out that uh, there exists a, ge a general LP relaxation that achieves a C versus S approximation, and the characterization says that what we have to do for that is we have to show that for every uh, non-negative cone of size R, so you know, generated by non-negative non function by R non-negative functions. You have to show that there exists a graph on n vertices where you know the optimal value is small, but uh, c smaller than c that's s, but the but c minus the cut function is 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 not in the cone, it's outside of the cone. Okay. And um, okay, now uh, and we want to relate this to Shirali atoms, and um, so here's the picture. So we, we somehow start from you know Shirali atoms, and we want to relate it to a general LP relaxations um, of of comparable size. And uh, we've seen that uh, Schreier atoms corresponds to the cone generated by d juntas, non-negative d juntas. We've seen that an arbitrary relaxation, you can think of it, you know, you can characterize it as a cone of general uh, non-negative functions. And now we will interpolate between uh, uh, d juntas and general uh, non-negative functions. And the way we'll interpolate is, is that we uh, do it in two steps. So one first thing is we consider larger juntas of size n to the epsilon. And uh, uh, the second step is to consider um, uh, functions that are not spiky, okay, functions that are sort of uh, have small variance in a certain sense. So let's uh, see how, and each of the steps is very simple. Um, some of the fact that you can, that the proof works by breaking up into these pieces is um, maybe not clear why that should work, but um, it uh, turns out to work. So let's each of these steps is simple. So let's uh, see the steps. So we want to go from d juntas to n to the epsilon juntas. Okay. So imagine that we have um, R functions that are n to the epsilon juntas. Okay. And uh, R is roughly n to the d. Okay. So we have these n to the d functions. They are n to the epsilon juntas. And uh, now what we want to say is that there exists a subset of the vertices of uh, you know not not too small, where these functions behave like d juntas. Okay. That would be good because you know then we Go from n to the epsilon juntas to d juntas. Okay, so let's. What does it mean uh, to find the set? So let's look at the junta sets of these R functions that we are given. Okay, the J1 up to JR. So these are sets of size n to the epsilon, uh, subsets of the vertices. Okay, so like here, roughly n to the d subsets of the vertices, each of size n to the epsilon. And what we want to show is that uh, that there exists some subset um, that's not too small. So that intersects each of these sets um, in at most d places. Okay, and now 
so that's what what we want to do. So that will show that uh, you know n to the epsilon. There's no difference between n to the epsilon juntas and d juntas. And um, now, how how do we come up with this set S? And you know, it's sort of clear how you how you, how you want to choose this set S. You know, you want to choose it at random. This will you know make it very unlikely that you have a large intersection which each which with, with uh, these sets. And so let's so that's the animation. I'm not sure if that. Let's try this again. It's visible. <laughs> so. Uh, um, so, so we have to compute for every. For every we'll, we'll compute for every um, set J sub R. Um, what's the probability that the intersection is larger than D? So this, this the size of the intersection is you know uh, sort of roughly distributed exponentially. So it, so, so it means that the uh, um, you know probability that it's larger than D is roughly you know the probability that's larger than one raised to the D, and the probability that it's larger than one is roughly n to the uh, one over n. Okay. So it means that you know the probability that uh, this intersection is larger than d is roughly uh, one over n to the d, and that's good, you know, because we only have uh, n to the d functions. So actually, we have you know I set things up in a way that we have smaller, you know, fewer than n to the d functions, and that means that we can do uh, you know a union bound over all these uh, r func over all these r sets, and that means that you know um, there exists you know um, and there exists a set um, where um, that has uh, that doesn't have large intersection with any of these uh, sets. Okay, that's good. So now uh, let's see how to go from n to the epsilon juntas to uh, non-spiky functions. So uh, let's, David, uh, yeah. sorry, don't you also have to worry about completeness, about what happens to the optimal cut? Ah, yes, that's uh, good. Uh, but here, you know, we uh, I'm saying if if you look at this subset of the vertices, there the the the, the, the relaxation behaves like a Schrödinger Adams relaxation. Now, you know, you, you can just Put your hard instance for Schrödinger atoms on this set, All right, and, right. and and keep the and and uh, you know don't don't use the other vertices, and that that will you know then it will not change right. the value the optimal value. I see Be again because the the constraints are do not depend on the instance. Uh, the cons yeah I, I mean we are also yeah we are also using that that, that you know that we we're using it always that uh, the right. solution space does not depend on the instances. Yeah, and, and, you know there are, there are very prominent examples where the solution space does depend on the instance. For example, for clique, you know the solution space does depend. Uh, you know because you know whether you, it's the set is a clique or not depends on what graph you're talking about. But I mean there there are ways to you know make these hard constraint into soft constraints, and then you can there are ways to talk about it. Um, but 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 then mm, it it doesn't the relaxations that you're considering are not very natural for clique. So, now, so David, you are basically taking an instance, padding it up, taking a small instance, padding it up. Like if it's hard yes. for level yes, D, you're yes, padding yes. it up, and then yeah, that's how the how the construction of the yeah, that's how you how you can think of the um, the, the the hard instance that you're constructing for the large LP. Okay. And yeah, another way, so this is you know, this technique is called random restriction. Often, it's you know, it's it's, it's also very powerful in. in to analyze, uh, to, for, you know, to prove circuit law bounds. Mm. Okay. So now um, about n to the epsilon juntas versus. So how can we go from n to the epsilon juntas to general functions? Okay. The, the first step will be non-spiky functions. So non-spiky functions are just functions, you know, where the maximum is not much larger than the average of the function. Okay, so this would be a function, an example of a function that is spiky. So here, you know, the maximum is much larger than the average. Um, but what we want is, you know, that it looks like this. The maximum is not much larger than the average. And so here, think of t as um, some constant times log n. That would be uh, the range we're interested in. Now, um, we, 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 the following Hunter approximation uh, lemma is true. Uh, so what it says is that uh, any non-spiky function like this can be approximated by a non-negative n to the epsilon Hunter, and the error that you are making is small. Okay. And the error being small means here that uh, the low degree Fourier coefficients of the error are small. Okay. So it might have large high degree Fourier coefficients, but uh, we don't. Uh, it turns out that we don't have to worry about that. Um, but uh, what we can prove is that the low degree Fourier coefficients are small. The way we we want to prove this is um, by sort of switching uh, domains, and uh, we'll switch domains as follows. So. You know, if you have a non-negative function on the hypercube, 
you can associate um, in a natural way a probability distribution over the hypercube. You know, just uh, you know, pick a point on the hypercube with probability proportional to the value of the function. Okay, now you have a probability distribution over the hypercube that corresponds to the non-negative function. And um, another way of looking at this probability distribution is that you have random variables, x1 up to xn. Each of the you know, variables is plus one, minus one valued. And they are dependent on each other. So that's sort of what you see if you pick a random point on the hypercube according to this distribution. These are the random variables that you see. Now, uh, non-spikiness, the non-spikiness of the function uh, translates to the entropy of the uh, of these random variables being close to the maximum uh, it can be, in, which is n. Is the ent entropy defect is at most t of this distribution. And uh, now. So how can we now phrase this Hunter approximation uh, theorem, uh, or the, what, we, what we want in the Hunter approximation? How can we phrase it in terms of this distribution? It turns out there's a very uh, natural way of phrasing it. So what we want is a, is a subset J of the vertices that should be of size n to the epsilon, because we are shooting for an n to the epsilon Hunter. And that set should have the property that if we take any set that is not a subset of J, so any set that is not completely contained in, in J, and we look at uh, the conditional distribution of xj conditioned on x, sorry, xs. So uh, uh, for every set s, not a subset of j. If you look at the random variables in s conditioned on the random variables in j, the distribution should be uniform, roughly close to uniform. Okay. And the way we f you can formalize the you know, distance to uniformity is, uh, in, again, in terms of entropies, what we say is that uh, if you look at the entropy defect of the distribution of uh, the variables in S, conditional on the variables in J, that entropy defect should be at most, should be small, should be at most beta. The beta is roughly one over n, uh, one divided by n to the epsilon. Okay. And uh, if, 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 you, if you take, you know, um, and this set, set J will, course, will, will give you the, 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 the non-negative uh, junta to approximate Q. And uh, the, the fact that these functions, uh, these, these um, distributions are close to uniform will translate to the Fourier coefficients being close to zero. Okay, there's a very small loss, but um, it's qualitatively the, the same. And um, yeah, an intu intuitive way to think about what, what we're saying here is that um, if you have a distribution that has high entropy, then there exists a small set of the variables such that if you condition on this set of the variables, everything else is very random. It's close to random. So, David, do you mean S and J disjoint, or do you really mean S not contained in yeah. J? No, uh, not, not, yeah, uh, S not a subset of J. Yes. So, S could, could have intersection with... Um, yeah. Okay, but then how can, how can it be that condition on X and the variables in J and then the variables in S look uniform? If you condition on those in J, the intersection is Fixed, right? Okay. Um, this is um, yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Um, maybe just mean the product of the as excess. Maybe it's just just be the product of them to represent the Fourier coefficient. No, no, I think I meant. Uh, hmm. um. Okay, let's let's say um, uh, let's let's restrict to uh, s s being. Uh, Outside of S, uh, S being outside of J. Okay. So yeah, so I'm slightly um, I'm not sure I remembered. Yes, but um, yeah, but yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's, yeah, the, I think uh, this is uh, probably yeah, this this seems not correct. Yeah. Um, okay, but so, so so yeah, so let's take uh, uh, S to be uh, di you know destroyed from J, and um, and then I mean, okay, there's maybe some question of whether 
Yes, I, I think um, I, th I think that's the that's the right. Um, uh, yeah, that, that it, should, it should be fine. Okay, now um, okay. So how, how can we construct this set uh, S? So the way we construct it is in a greedy way. So we will we will start with J being the empty set, and uh, whenever we see um, a set uh, a set S that you know outside of J that violates this condition, you know where the entropy is not close to uh, as large as it can be, we will add um, we will add uh, S to J, and um, and, and, and we continue, continue. So, so J will grow in this way, and uh, you know it, we only stop uh, when 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 uh, no uh, no offending uh, sets remain. Okay. So now the question, only question is, uh, you know, do we stop stop early enough? Okay. And uh, the reason why we stop early enough is because uh, precisely because this the total entropy defect of the distribution was at most t, and uh, when uh, you know, and and, and we add. Uh, uh, the set uh, S to J only if um, you know S is disjoint from J, and so so it means that um, like also the entropy loss that you have here. But right? here you experience an entropy loss of beta. Um, so, so so it means that it accumulates. Okay, so it means every time you um, uh, you add uh, uh, set uh, you add uh, set S to at, 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 for every iteration. You lose uh, beta of, of the entropy. In total, you know, you can lose at most t of the entropy, and uh, because that's the total entropy defect of the distribution, and that means that the number of iterations is bounded by t divided by beta, and uh, and that means that you know that uh, the, the size of j is at most uh, t divided the number of iterations t divided by beta times the sizes of the sets that you're considering, and we, you know we focus on sets that are smaller than d. So it means that the size is bound by d times t divided by beta, which is into the epsilon uh, in the way we set up uh, beta. Is that the choice that you how to construct a, uh, a set uh, J that captures uh, all of the correlations in the distribution, and uh, this this will translate to uh, Hunter approximation. Uh, David, every Fourier coefficient might differ by as much as t d over into the epsilon, and they enter the d such Fourier coefficients. So yes, uh, mm, yes. So that's a, that's a good point. So um, uh, so the 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 reason why why we uh, why we don't uh, die is because uh, we um, so for, so for that you have to uh, think about in some sense the um, okay, the reason is that in some sense we only care about the errors of the Fourier coefficients. Um, that for this, okay. Let me go back for the set S that we are um, picking out at this step. Okay, and this has size m. Okay, and that means that um, you know, um, in some sense, you only have m to the d um, Fourier coefficients that you really care about um, uh, at, at this step. And uh, and and. Uh, um, so let's see. So it might be that we have different uh, epsilons here. Yes, yes. You might have to. I mean, okay, m, m, m might have to be smaller than m to the epsilon. But that uh, that's that's only better. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so I think. Um, so, so so you set things up that so that the set that you are. Um, Picking out in the random restriction part, uh, that the, uh, the size of the set is m, and uh, you set it up so that m to the d times the error that you're making in each coefficient is very small. Okay. Yes. And the reason why you can do this is because um, m uh, can be very small, so the the part where you restrict to randomly can be very small. Okay, so now how, how to go from non-spiky functions to general functions? So the way uh, this, so the, the general claim is that if you have uh, R general non-negative functions, then um, you know you can find uh, non-spiky functions. Uh, the the you know being at most n to the two 
n to the d roughly um, more than the average. So this corresponds to t being roughly d times log n, which is pretty small. And um, in these, these, these new functions, they, they generate roughly the same cone. With, you know, here this approximation is, uh, you have to sort of use this, the correct measure. Um, so this part is a little bit, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit subtle, but the idea is very simple. So the idea is just, um, uh, it's just to truncate the functions carefully. Um, and the, I mean, the only thing that, um, and, and, and what what saves you here? I mean, you know, in general, if you, um, if, you know, if you truncate these functions, you know, these cones could look very different. But um, but the point is that you only care what what you care about these cones is whether they include these functions c minus the cut function of a graph or not. Okay, so you only care in, about inclusion with respect to these um, these kind of functions, and uh, these kind of functions they are very uh, balanced. They are they are not spiky at all. You can see that you know think of C as you know maybe uh, two thirds, and um, then um, um, you know the average value of the cut function is half you know, because a random cut cuts only half of the edges of a graph, and um, you know the the large as this can be is at most C. Okay. So it means this, this this function here, you know, is within a constant factor, of, and c c is a number between you know, zero and one. So this here is within a constant factor of its average. So it's it's you know, extremely non-spiky, and, uh, and 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 so that means that you know, if, if it, it's it's uh, you know if if you have uh, spiky functions and you're trying, you know, if you're trying to express a non-spiky function with very spiky functions, um, th then there's something off. So you know. Uh, intuitively, uh, very spiky functions they don't help you to express uh, the the cut function these 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 functions because they are they are not spiky at all. So that's just the uh, intuition that I wanted to give here. So this is the overview of what we saw. So we wanted to go from uh, general Adams variations to general variations. We saw that Schroeder Adams corresponds to juntas, de juntas, small juntas. We saw that general, func general relaxations correspond to cones generated by general non-negative functions, and we interpolated between the two uh, kind of cones. Uh, there are three open course questions that I wanted to highlight. So one is, <coughs> we saw this universality, this universality result holds for, um, what, 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 our proof works for um, up to almost quasi-polynomial size. Um, but you know, it would be very surprising if you had, uh, you know, um, a, a sub-exponential size LP that solves NP hard problems. So, uh, so, so it would be good to uh, um, to rule out that to show that you know, you need LPs of uh, size at least two to the n to the epsilon to get, let's say, get a 0.99 approximation for max cut. Okay. This is something that you know should be true just because this problem is NP hard, but uh, we don't know how to prove it at this point. Another question is: So this was you know, this work was about as a universality result for uh, CSP problems, and um, it would be nice to have similar universality results for other problems like the Trevor Salesman problem. Um, you know, some somewhere that you identify the correct uh, LP relaxation for this problem. You say that you know, no matter what LP relaxation uh, that you use for TSP. Uh, you know this particular LP relaxation will provide you uh, will provide a better approximation and at, at, at with roughly the same uh, size. Uh, third open question is uh, to um, prove lower bounds for STP relaxations. So here we we actually don't have any uh, lower bounds for explicit problems that hold for general STP um, formulations, even no matter if you talk about approximation or exact uh, solving things exactly. Um, uh, Mad, uh, sorry, the, David. Madhu has a, prob a question. I'm not sure uh, I understand the question. So, Madhu, uh, would you like to ask a question? Okay. Mm. Sorry, we can't hear you. I think the microphone is still muted, or uh, in some form. Really? Okay. Uh, 
okay now we can't hear you uh no not able to understand the question uh, the context of the question well, let me read the question maybe david can make sense of it so mother mm. asked so so this can be used to approximate any family of symmetric distributions instead of uniform right um what do you mean by symmetric Symmetric distributions? So, uh, so uh, can you repeat the question on it? Um, didn't quite. Oh, I, I can repeat, but it's. Uh, okay, so a mother says uh, DS depends only on the cardinality of S. I guess you have to go back a slide or two. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> mm. so, so, okay. I mean, so, so maybe, like, I mean, if it was important that we used here that the distribution is high entropy. I'm not sure. I mean, it was probably not the question, but uh, yeah. I mean, maybe okay if. Uh, if uh, so let, let me just uh, maybe say, say what I wanted to say uh, as I'm, okay. I'm almost done. Uh, maybe maybe okay. we get the question later. Um, so, so, so these all these questions are open uh, for general uh, formulations, but it turns out that if you restrict yourself to symmetric relaxations, which is um, you know the kind of I mean for 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 combinatorial observation problems, the relaxations that based on relaxations they have this symmetry property. You know, Meaning that you know the relaxation doesn't really change if you rename um, the vertices of your graph, then um, uh, we, we, you can get um, all of these uh, um, all of these extensions. So you know, for symmetric uh, uh, relaxations, uh, you, you can get uh, lower bounds up to uh, into the epsilon, and uh, you, you can get a universality result for for drawing salesman problem. And uh, it also turns out that uh, among symmetric um, uh, semi-definite programming relaxations, the the sum of squares uh, relaxation is uh, uni universal, in the same way that, um, or in, in a similar way that uh, M's um, relaxation is universal for um, among uh, general LP relaxations. But but here uh, at this point we only know it for uh, symmetric uh, relaxations. Okay, so that was. Uh, uh, all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, if, if there are questions, uh, please try to get them to me. Okay. Uh, Thanks, David. <laughs> Thank you. David, also for those who are watching on the YouTube channel. If anyone wants to join us now to ask questions from the uh, for those who are just watching uh, on YouTube, uh, feel free to leave a comment and I'll let you in. Uh, send me the link. Um, Madhur, let's try again. Just unmute your microphone and shout or something. Because I hear noise. Like now, I hear I hear noise, but I can't hear you. Strange. Do you think like maybe the computer is trying to? Is it, is the microphone connected there? Like something is connected there in the? Yeah, strange. Okay. <laughs> you can you can call my phone now. Call, call David. <laughs> call his, David's office and just uh, communicate directly. Is there some check that they can see? Okay, maybe I can. Ah, okay. see. Um, yeah, let's see if anyone else wants to join before we. Uh... So actually, I want uh, I would suggest like for the spikiness, uh, trying to get rid of the spikiness. Could you apply some kind of uh, a noise operator to smooth the function, uh, because that shouldn't change the max cut by too much. Yeah. Yes. So this. Um, so there's a. So you mean this step here? Yes. So, so there's a way to. No, actually, I think I meant. I think I, no. Sorry, I meant the, the ah, last one. Yeah, I meant the last, last step. One. Not, yeah, not no, yeah. No. So, so here, it seems really important to do the truncation because I mean, you could have. Um, you know, like there's you know no particular reason. I mean, you know, your functions could include. Um, one of these uh, funny basis functions, like the you know the one and precisely one point and zero everyone else everywhere else, 
And now, you know, if you want to smooth uh, smooth out uh, these kind of functions, that, that takes a lot of uh, noise. And you, you can't these afford. These are spiky. Noise. How can you? So how can you? Oh, you just. Uh, so, so, so the in point, case, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. The, yeah, one way to think about it is that uh, if you look at the places where the functions are very spiky, like where they're much larger than uh, you know you expect them to be, then this can only be a very small fraction of the hypercube. And um, and and in some sense, um, this um, um, I mean, and 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 this small fraction of the hypercube, you, in a certain sense, you, you can ignore it. Um, so. Right, because you're taking in the product with a function that's almost constant. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so so there are some kind of. Um, L, uh, L1 and infinity. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes, L1 and infinity. Mm -hmm. And, um, yes. Yeah, the previous step sounds a bit like the argument you have, like, um, this entropy argument, like an angularity lemma proof, or anything. Yes, yes. Some part that's still not smooth, you add it, and then you, you improve the entropy. Okay, so I think. I just missed a call by Madhur, but I think I, I sort of I think I understand. So, so I think Madhur is asking whether, like, we didn't really use that um, uh, th that these x one variables are plus one minus one variables. Hello. Yes, I hear. It's good. There's modern technology, but we're still using phones. <laughs> I see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So I think I, I okay. I think I see what you, uh, what you what you're asking. Okay, so let me just uh, I can do it. Uh, <laughs> but but we, we didn't hear the question, so we want to. Yeah, yeah, so, sorry, yes. so uh, the question is that I mean here it's like the 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 underlying or the the model distribution that you have in mind is the uniform distribution over the hypercube. And uh, like, if you have another optimization problem in mind, maybe not max cut, um, you know, this could be a uniform distribution over TSP tours or over matchings or you know anything like that. And um, the question is if if the same argument um, would uh, would still work. And um, so it's it's not completely clear uh, uh, to me. I think. Like, especially sort of this connection with the with the uh, with the Fourier co with the Fourier co co uh, coordinates, I think um, you know it uses that that this is like a product distribution. So uh, I mean, for sure. I mean, if, if you talk about product distributions, and um, uh, not sure if uh, Madhur just want uh, another question for product distributions, but uh, so so for for product distributions, which is actually an interesting case, uh, which is you know it corresponds to CSPs. With larger alphabet sizes, but if, if these are not just plus one minus one, but could be, you know, random variables over more symbols, then this would correspond to CSPs with the larger alphabets, and so so, so then this would still make uh, sense, and you would have some loss in terms of the size of the alphabet. But usually we think of the size of the alphabet as constant, so it would be uh, not that bad. Um, but um, if, if if it's not a product distribution, then I I don't know. Uh, I, I would think that. Um, Naively, uh, the, the proof would uh, would break, but uh, in principle, uh, these kind of arguments uh, would uh, um, could work. I mean, the reason is also like these these Fourier definition uh, Fourier coefficients. They um, the, you know the, the way um, we usually think about them, they they, they make sense only if, or you know they're sort of uh, tied to 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 the concept of um, product distributions.
Yeah, I hope that uh, roughly uh, answers uh, the question. If there's uh... yes, Madur says yes. So. <laughs> At least, uh, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, great. Um, mm. So if there are no more questions, I guess we can take it off here now. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see any more questions also on the Google Plus page. So thanks everyone for joining, also those who are in the YouTube stream, and I hope to see everyone back in the spring. Thanks again, David. I'm um, uh, go offline. You can still you can still stay here. Uh, I'll just go offline.